My name's Ben Connolly. I'm not famous, I don't have a big company, and I don't have millions of dollars. But what I do have is a story to share. I was a skydiving instructor and freefall cameraman, and I used to run out the back of aeroplanes at 14,000 feet. 18 years ago on the 26th of May 2002 at 9.10am in the morning, my life changed forever. You hear about these accidents all the time in the news or through social media. Can you share with our viewers what exactly happened on that day? Yeah, so um, it was it was a Sunday. Basically, it was the first jump uh, of our of our day. We had a, a ten load day happening. So I was the videographer who was filming the tandems as they actually jumped out of the aircraft. I would be the idiot with a camera on my head hanging out of the aeroplane with one hand, hanging on to the tandem with the other. And as they jumped out, I would jump out and free fall down with them at the same level. And then obviously take photos and take video footage of, of their actual jump. On this particular day, I, I had a video camera on the side of my helmet. I had a still camera on the top. The still camera had a little shutter release cable that it was a, a little thing that sort of popped through the helmet into my mouth. And I actually had to take photos by going, by pushing it with my tongue. This particular day, we got out of the airplane too far away from our landing area and uh, we couldn't make it back. Uh, I think there was about six uh, tandems actually on the load. So that's about 13 people. Uh, including myself as a videographer. And on that load, none of the passengers, none of the tandems actually made it back to the designated landing area. It was a, a spotting problem, basically. So the spotter looks out of the aircraft and basically decides where we get out. So spotter got that wrong uh, and it was a chain reaction of events that followed after that. So basically we got out of the airplane, we were too far away from our landing area, we couldn't make it back. And <clears throat> I was in a position where I had to choose where I was gonna land. Uh, and there really wasn't anywhere to land. <laughs> I either had to pick a, a major roadway or a sort of a, not a highway, but it was a, a major arterial road, or I was going to land in, in the creek, um, or I could try to land basically where I did crash land, um, which was uh, a retirement village. And due to the wind conditions that were a bit unknown because it was the first jump of the day, every possible option that I tried to go for didn't work. Everything that could have possibly went wrong, man, went wrong. And I was just in a position where I had to go where I had to go. And I uh, came in over the top of the trees, the houses and power lines and that sort of thing. And as I came in, I got a big push of wind from behind me, which was going to push me into the river system or into the lake, or it was going to make me hit the bridge that was separating the, um, the retirement village and that, and that lake. So I did what they call a hook turn, where you turn 180 degrees around and then land the other way. And in skydiving terms, that is the number one killer of skydiving dudes and girls. Yeah, when a parachute turns, it doesn't turn flat on the sort of or just around. It actually turns and dives. So you're, you're like a pendulum underneath the actual parachute wing itself. It's increased my speed and I literally missed the turn by a foot. So had I've made that turn a foot higher, I probably would have scraped my knees on the ground and had to run like the road runner. Uh, had I've made it a foot lower, we wouldn't be talking right now. I uh, essentially hit the ground at about 100 kilometres an hour uh, at about 45 degrees. It smashed my femur, it broke on my ribs, uh, I collapsed the lung, I nearly bit the end off my tongue. I had internal bleeding, um, I couldn't feel my right leg. Apparently a, 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 when, you, when you break a femur, it's actually quite loud. Didn't know what it was at the time, but I actually heard that break as I hit the ground. I was still awake, I was still conscious a bit of a gut-wrenching decision as to whether I take my helmet off or not because I didn't know if I'd had spinal injuries. I didn't know if it could break my neck or anything like that. So rolled the dice and, and took my helmet off. Uh, luckily, it didn't break my neck, which I'm pretty happy about. Basically, just waited for someone to come and save me, really. How long did it take till somebody actually came and rescued you or took you to the hospital? If for anyone that's been in that situation, you lose all concept of time and everything else. Um, but I, I think it was probably only a minute or something before I saw someone come running around and, and they kind of screamed out, do you need an ambulance? And, and obviously I couldn't, I couldn't breathe um, and I was still bleeding from the mouth. So I kind of just waved my arm and, and that was all I could manage. The next thing I knew I had um, was four or five paramedics that were there. Get the parachute, actually the, the actual parachute and, the, and the, the harness and everything off me. We're cutting things away, were giving me pain relief. Um, I, I woke up uh, in the emergency section of the hospital probably two or three hours later. 
uh, and then I had to wait. Um, I think it was about another 11 hours before they could actually operate. Did you have any family that came right away at the hospital or who was the first person you remember seeing? I may get emotional. I, I apologize if I do. To be honest with you, the first person that I actually remember seeing is my grandmother. She had been dead for 30 years. I know that kind of blows your mind, but um, while I was waiting there, it was the first time I'd ever broken anything. First time I'd sort of damaged myself. First time I'd been in hospital. So there was, they had to put a, a, a big rod in my leg. I started to, to hyperventilate and I started to get quite stressed. There was a, uh, a nurse, uh, an elderly nurse who came into the room, sat with me, brought me a, a CD Walkman, a, a, a Discman sort of thing with the old dodgy headphones and stuff, um, sat with me, held my hand. She put on a Frank Sinatra album and basically I just laid there and held her hand and, and went to sleep. Woke up as they were wheeling me into surgery. About three or four days after that, in recovery, uh, I asked one of the nurses who I actually knew, I said, who can you please thank that elderly nurse that, that sat with me, was there with me during that, that time when I was freaking out? And she's gone, oh, well, who was it? What can you describe her? And I've gone, yeah, she was probably late 50s white hair little nurses watch white uniform like little nurses hat the whole lot my friend kind of went a bit white and she said dude there's no one that's like that here like we all wear blue uniforms here i knew there was someone confused me a bit but i let it go because i thought oh, i must have just been all the morphine that i had and that sort of thing but about three weeks later i told my mum, and um she actually sent me a photo of my grandmother who happened to be uh, an Air Force nurse, and was basically wearing exactly what I described and remembered. That's the first person that I saw. <laughs> How has your perspective changed after an event like this, and even through a strenuous healing process? You know, it took about five years to, to actually get back to normality again. I had five different surgeries to, to fix things. I, I was kind of young and stupid then, and... I, I felt like I was a little bit immortal, as we all do. You know, riding motorbikes, driving fast cars, the, your typical adrenaline junkie. And nothing really changed for me for about 10 years. Kind of shrugged it off and went, you know what, I'm okay. I'm, I'm 43 now and, and I'm ex-military. I think as you get older, you start to question your mortality, uh, your mortality a little bit more and, and you start to take less risks and you start to be a little bit more careful and a little bit more grateful for what you actually got and who you are and, and what you can give back to the world. On the 10 year anniversary, I actually went back into the retirement village and sort of sat there where I hit the ground. There was a, an old gentleman that came out and he asked me what I was doing there. And I said to him, oh, I, I left a big imprint on the ground here about 10 years ago, skydiving. He's going, oh, I remember you. I, I put a pillow on you. <laughs> to have him remember me, I've got a bit of a story here now that maybe I should share this with the world a little bit and try to use that as a bit of a catalyst to help people change and to help people live a remarkable life and that sort of thing. And it was about the time I'd converted from uh, being a videographer to a photographer, built up my business, built up my reputation, won a lot of international awards with photography and now I have the pleasure of being a brand ambassador for a couple of different companies and I actually get to share this story, help and educate and inspire people to bring their visions to life and to hopefully live remarkable lives for themselves. I think there's, there's a lot of us out there who kind of take our lives for granted. In the blink of an eye, you're done. You have a little bit more gratitude for life. That's kind of been the path I was on. During COVID, has, this year has been a dumpster fire for everyone on the planet, I reckon. I managed to sit down this year when all of my weddings and all of my work just vanished in the blink of an eye and I wrote a book. I created a legacy piece, which is a, uh, a photography program, an online program for photography to take people from a complete novice, complete beginner, all the way through to having a full understanding of, of photography and business and actually running their own business, sort of a 12 week kind of period. The experience and everything comes in years after that. This is a program to help people to actually start properly. This incident changed your path into photography because I noticed on your Instagram, that's what you do and it seems like it's your passion but most recently too you've been posting a lot of weddings is there a significant taking photos and weddings for you as humans we stick to what we're good at i do about 40 to 60 weddings a year depending on the year it's a highly emotional charged day but it's it's good emotions and you get to hang out with people that are happy that are having fun that I'll, I'll do some cool composite portraits and that fulfills me. That sort of brings my vision of life and, and vocation sort of together and allows me to help people. With this year so, being so difficult on everyone, 
what advice would you give to those who feel that they're on the brink of giving up or feel that they can't overcome their current circumstances? A lot of us have different things going on. When you look at someone, there's a whole lot of stuff in the background that you don't see. All all you see is the facade and and what they choose to show the world. For me, I had a breakup at the beginning of this year, which was pretty devastating because I thought she was the woman that I was going to marry. Super tough to get through this year personally but not super tough in, in work-wise and, and financially because I have a quite a good business set up and savings. It's a bit of goal setting, trying to put on your blinkers for, for everyone out there that is struggling at the moment and, and the world is on top of you. You don't have to get to the top. Like you've just got to take the next step. More that you can set yourself a goal to achieve and, and achieve that goal and celebrate the win when you achieve that goal. It doesn't matter how big that goal is. If, if you can achieve that, then you feel good about you. You feel good that you can achieve something greater. Then you set yourself something greater and then you work to achieving that. It's just that one foot in front of the other. Reach out to the people who are around you and, and if you need help, ask for help. At the beginning of this year, when I was in my little darkest place, um, I didn't reach out for help. All of those friends, as humans, we, we don't want to reach out. You, you might get some messages from friends being, hey, you okay, you know, that sort of thing. Let me know if you want to talk. That's as far as that goes. Your friend is not going to push and push and push and go, hey, come on, you need to talk, you need to talk, you need to talk. If you get that message, hey, reach out if you need to talk, fucking reach out. No one's going to come in and, and save you. Uh, Whatever it is, just celebrate the win when you have it. I've been in a lot of rooms with a lot of incredibly amazing business people and I have a question that I ask all of those people and that question is, if you could walk outside and run into an 18-year-old version of yourself, what would be the question or what would be the advice that you would give your 18-year-old self? 99% of those incredible business people have always said to me, focus on one thing, be amazing at one thing and then when you nail it, celebrate it and move on to the next thing that's something i struggled with was reaching out to others i try to do everything on my own as yeah. dudes we just we oh i don't want to reach out no i think a lot of times we get too far ahead of ourselves and then we over overthink over stress but if we just focus one thing nail it celebrate it like you said and move on to the next and we'll be able to conquer some things that we feel are maybe holding us back one of the best things that you can do is something for someone else when we have the lowest points in our life it's always because something's happened to us but quite often you'll find when people are at their highest point it's because they've done something for someone else it's it's they've helped someone achieve something they've they've become part of something bigger we're humans we all need to be a part of something bigger to feel within the community If you can do something for somebody else to make somebody else's life amazing, man, it's going to come back to you, I promise. It may not be right now, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be a week from now, but it will come back. The emotions and the feelings that you get from helping someone else, that's that's got to make you feel better. It does for me, I'm sure it does for you as well. Well, Ben, thank you so much for sharing your story and for your time. I mean, you're just a walk inspiration and we appreciate everything you do. I hope you and your loved ones stay safe and healthy during this holiday season and thank you so much again can i just say for for everyone out there that's watching please jump on my instagram it's ben underscore Connolly underscore photographer we fly anywhere in the world to shoot wedding i'm in the u.s uh, pretty much every year apart from next year because of covid if you're getting married please yeah, jump on instagram follow us both on instagram and uh please stay safe look after one another look after yourself and uh thanks very much Thank you.